Welcome everyone to our Inside the Box lecture series. And tonight is really special. It's a great honor to introduce our speaker. Um, Lothar Windels, I've known for quite some time and I, I truly fell in love with the chair I wanted to use in a project. And I remember pestering him to, to, turn, to manufacture it. And so I'll, I'll have to find out by the end of the lecture if it's now in, in mass produced. Um, Lothar Windels focuses on furniture and product design ranging from mass produced, one of a, mass produced to one of a kind pieces. Born in Germany, he earned his Bachelor of Industrial Design from the Rhode Island School of Design in the United States and his Master's in Design Products from the Royal College of Art in London. Currently, he runs his studio in Boston and teaches as professor in the Department of Furniture Design at the Rhode Island School of Design. Lothar Windel's projects include the Joseph Felt Chair. We have a picture of that in our new soft tech lab. Featured in ex exhibitions in Berlin, Boston, London, Milan, Munich, Tokyo, and Zurich. His work has been published in several books and magazines, including Abitare, Design Report, Frame, L Decoration, ID Magazine, Interni, MD Mobile Interior Design, Metropolis, Newsweek, and the World of Interiors. His recent research focuses on active seating, which dynamically supports the human body in motion to provide an overall better seating experience, sitting experience. This is important, I think. The Canadian office furniture and manufacturer Nine Camper produces his bracket chair, which won the Design Journal Platinum Award for Design Excellence. His clients include Converse, Inflate, ONG Studio, Swarovski, Umbra, and the Vitra Design Museum. Really, you're an amazing uh, CV here. And um, I'm welcome to uh, welcome to Lothar. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Great. Well, um, I will open up my, um, well, before I open up, I really want to uh, thank you for the invite. Um, it's, it's really an honor to be here. And also I want to say thank, say thank you to Aaron that you made this um, uh, possible so smoothly. So bear with me for a second. Um, I will uh, put my screen on. And I mean, uh, Carol did such a good job introducing me that there's there's not much to add. But um, so I'm I, I grew up in Germany, Hamburg. Um, I actually studied two two weeks of medicine, and um, I didn't like that that much. Uh, and then my father actually told me that I should stu study architecture. And as a good son, I said, no, I don't want to do that. Um, but I, I did actually study two years of architecture before I did industrial design. Um, and that was a very good foundation. So I just want to add that to um, uh, what Carol was saying. Um, I also, um, after the RCA, I lived in, well, after my undergraduate degree, I worked in New York for two years for furniture manufacturer Dakota Jackson for two years. That was really an important time. And then after my um, degree, uh, my master's degree in um, in London, I also moved in uh, lived in Germany, uh, back in Germany, in Munich for three day, three, uh, two and a half years and run my own studio there. So I just wanna add that. Um, but now I will jump right into the lecture. Um, and there, the, the lecture is um, structured into uh, three segments. Uh, the first segment is material structure and technology. Um, so uh, then the, the, the second one is redefining the archetype. I will. I will explain that better when I get there. Improving experience, that's uh, what Carol alluded to. Um, um, me uh, trying to improve sitting experience and design, the last one is designing for a community. community. Um, so I'm starting out with the first one. Uh, so 
obviously a material structure and technology have a big influence on my work. Um, and I'm showing you the first project um, that was uh, produced by Umbra, which is a Canadian company. And I did this design when I, in between my bachelor and master degree when I was working at Dakota Jackson. And um, the, the most important thing, I mean, there's one very important thing about this um, product still up to date, and it's not so much when I approached the company, I really didn't approach the company so much with a form. I really more approached them with this. Uh, what is this? Um, it's a off the shelf socket. And it's an injection molding that runs on the stem. Um, so it's really about creating a feature uh, that's very inexpensive uh, to manufacture and gives the, the product um, something um, at a low, very low price point um, that um, other products don't have. So it's, it's, more about, it's more about the core idea of a product than rather than it looks. Um, also, I mean, one has to understand that this this product uh, was produced overseas. It retailed for $50. So that means that it has to be produced for $12.50. So um, if you can add something to add that um, to a product like that in a very cost-effective way, that's very attractive uh, to a manufacturer. Um, I will say, um, I, I, in hindsight, I, it was a great experience, um, especially for a first project. I personally um, not so sure if I still would be interested in doing that. And that um, has two reasons. It is a cheap product that breaks. And also it's very, very hard to do product development uh, with so many people in between there. Uh, and maybe I come to that later, um, or I will, I will speak about that later a little bit. Um, the next project, um, that's, that's for Carol, um, is a chair that I, uh, designed when I was at my studio in, in Germany. Um, it's based on this, uh, archetype. I mean, this, this piece of furniture exists all over the world. Uh, it's a milk stool, it's a board and four sticks uh, and a little bit of decoration on the side, maybe it depends on the region. Um, and I was always fascinated by the simplicity of the of this um, design. And so I turned that into a chair, uh, which is a plywood shell. And it's uh, four die castings. Um, this is a prototype. Uh, the the um, the die casting would have a groove, and the the shell would be CNC with a tenon, and then um, that would connect it. What's uh, not only Carol appreciated this design. I got a lot of good responses for this um, chair, and the reason I think is because it's really different. I mean, you have a lot of stacking chairs uh, that have a shell and um, the, and a frame underneath it. What this chair does is actually merging uh, frame and shell and put it on one plane. Um, functionally, that has the advantage that uh, stacks XDV slim um, and also um, um, has a, I mean, it's definitely um, it functions different, it looks different. Um, here's a close up. Um, the detailing of um, how the, how the um, die cast meets the, uh, meets the shell that was very, that there is structural com uh, consideration because that's how you create triangulation. So again, 
really working from the inside out, really understand what the project needs rather than how it looks and then developing from there. Um, again, um, a lot of interest, a lot of companies looked into it. I think uh, one has to understand um, uh, that um, as a designer or uh, um, um, there, there are companies look at this and they say, well, I have to put the research and development of this for two to five years. That's a lot of money. And um, it's also a little bit area of the unknown. And the other thing I will say, it's very expensive to have four different legs on one chair. That's one chair. Um, that, that's, that's a lot of cost for a company. Um, so I'm, I'm moving on. Um, 10 years later, I did also a table that goes with it. It's a, um, it's a band lamination so that it's actually not really frameless. Uh, so the whole tabletop with the apron is one band lamination. And then this design had, has the advantage that um, um, there's only one die casting involved. Um, so that was a frameless chair. Um, the, the, this project is a Joseph Feld chair. That's probably the, um, the project that got me the, be uh, the best uh, publicity. Um, this was produced, uh, um, not produced, made uh, as my final degree project. And there, there are a couple of uh, funny things about this. My uh, project uh, leader or department head was Ro Ron Arad at that time. And he said, well, Lord, uh, and we had a very good relationship. He said, Lota, I mean, you're okay, but uh, your stuff is too boring. Um, and he was kind of challenging me that way. And when it came to the final degree project, I said, well, Ron, I will make one really boring chair and I will make one chair um, that you might not think is that boring and not that rational. Uh, though this chair is actually, uh, there's some production logic uh, involved in that. So that was interesting. The other thing, a story about this chair is I was a student, felt it's very expensive, wasn't that expensive at that time, still was expensive. It cost $3,000 to make two chairs. So I, I was like, I need somebody, I need to ask somebody to sponsor me. So I wrote an email to Rolf Fehlbaum at that point was a chair of Vitra, which is, in my opinion, one of the, um, well, it's a very good furniture, office furniture company. And he wrote me back and he said, well, yeah, like the project, get you the money. Well, the moral of the story, don't be afraid to ask. And then the second moral is then the chair was done uh, I wrote them a second email. I said, well, I have two chairs now uh, and I'm, um, I donate one to you, which was very, I mean, it was very pres presumptuous. I mean, Vitra Design Museum is one of the, the places to be. And they said, yes. So don't, don't be afraid to be presumptuous <laughs> and dream big. That's the moral of the story. So, it doesn't happen a lot, but sometimes it happens. So um, then I continue doing this chair. Um, the chair that you're seeing is actually in the Rissi Museum that is um, red uh, custom dyed felt uh, and the outside is, is um, off the shelf gray felt. They have different density. The in, in between um, red layer is very soft and the outside is very firm. And with the two layers, you can really dial in the comfort of the chair. Um, so then I took this further, uh, uh, developed that more commercially with my brother. Uh, we work with off the shelf felt. Uh, that's why we put the gray inside and the color on the outside uh, because that's available. Um, 
we really refined how we put it together. We we did an ottoman, uh, but it it proved to be very hard um, to bring this to market without a company. Um, then this is in 2019. The Atlas of Furniture came out, and it's a very Euro-centric um, publication, uh, which I find um, a little bit problematic, but I'm not complaining that I'm in. Um, I, the photo is not very well, uh, uh, is not very good, um, but to be on the same page with the air chair by Jesper Morrison is uh, a big honor. Um, and then this is um, funny because this is a 20th year anniversary edition uh, that I just uh, finished last year. I just went back to the single layer because I think it's so much more iconic um, and um, it's custom dyed felt. Um, so it's, it's actually, it, it, I mean, actually in general, I, I mean, I don't think it's a good idea to look back. I think it's much better to look forward. But it was it was fun to look back after 20 years. I'm still looking forward. Um, that's actually also um, one of the reasons. I mean, when you show something to a couple of companies and um, you feel that um, you put in the time, it's not, it's, I mean, in a way it's, it's, I mean, and I'm talking about the frameless chair. Of course, it would be nice to see it in production, but it's also time to move on. And what you learn from that experience, nobody can take that from you, you have that. Um, so the, the last um, project that I'm showing in this category is um, the chair that I did with Nian Camper. And I think, uh, what is important to note here is um, um, when you work with a company, um, there's no way that you show them a product and that product will get implemented the way you showed it to them in the beginning. Actually, that would be that would be wrong. I mean, that's not, I don't think that would be good. It doesn't happen. If you work with a company, you really have to um, look what their capacity is and you really have to together try to make the best product with what you have. And some people call that compromise, um, which I don't have a problem with. I don't think it's such a, it, to me, that's not a dirty word. Um, I, I think um, compromises, I mean, it's not the right word, but I mean, working together and um, working through the limitations and trying to get the best results of that um, is really a way of um, the way I really enjoyed working. So that's, it's, it's different. If you're a painter, you paint, you put the painting in the gallery. I think as an industry designer, you, you, you have a mock-up, you have a prototype, and then you go to a manufacturer and that's where we, really the work um, begins is, is not the right word, but it, where it's part of the process to, uh, to bring it through the production process, which I think is really enjoyable. And it's, it's a, um, if you have the right people, it's really fun. And now I'm coming back to the, with Neon Camper, I could talk to them very directly. I went to Toronto and that's what I meant with the color lamp. It was so removed. And, and personally, I, at, at this point of my life, I only have um, interest in working with companies where it's a very uh, personal interaction. Um, so uh, they made the prototype, uh, their first product, full sale prototype in their, um, facility uh, in Toronto, Canada. It's a great facility. And it was, it was very apparent 
explained right away that um, the shell was too thin. You can even see that in this picture. And um, that the, the detail of the side detail that was pretty much a whole chair, they really had a problem executing that crisply. So um, I came there, they warned me a little bit before. Uh, the shell was much thicker, which actually was fine. But then they got rid of the detail and I was like, you can't do that. Um, and then it really um, took a while and they put it on a, on a base and they said, it looks great. And I said, no, it doesn't look great. For me to understand that when you had the side detail uh, that was gone, that we ha you had to shift your thinking. And now the detail was actually of the chair is actually the, in the front where you have the U of the frame uh, mirroring the U of, of the shell. Um, and then in the end, uh, when you work for an office manufacturer, you always create line extensions. So you have, a, uh, it comes on a swivel base, um, five star base, disc base. So you, you're building a line. Uh, that's, that's very important. It's not only one chair. Okay, that was the section of material structures and technology. Now we're getting to uh, redefining the archetype. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm, I have no interest in historic um, reviving um, historic period. Um, I think the archetype is a little bit different. I worked for Dakota Jackson. I prototyped a lot of chairs. Um, and I thought after that experience, I was like, you know what, before I die, I have to make a wood chair. So these were the first wood chairs that I made. They're very, very minimal, uh, very, in a way, um, they're predictable and not very comfortable. Um, then I had the pleasure to work with a company, ONG, and they're very local to Rhode Island, Warren, Rhode Island. And they work with the, the typology of a Windsor chair. And uh, I, I approached them with a design. I, I made a very, they, they, their chairs are bigger. And I was like, we have to make a Windsor chair that's more like a Tonant number 14 chair. So it has, a, uh, which is kind of, I mean, can't really say that. Um, but um, because the, uh, um, the toner chair is so technologically advanced and this is almost more backwards. But anyway, so it has a very small footprint, which is attractive for contract restaurants. And then it has a triangulation in the back with a center spindle that goes into below the base, which is not common for Windsor chairs. Um, and I think this is much better than the solid chair uh much more comfortable much more human the component you can really understand how the components come together and there's in my opinion and um, um it's a it's a much more humane chair and um the next thing um pretty recently uh well talk about archetypes uh the uh, uh geo ponti did the Suva Legger chair, and he looked at a lot of um, archetypical chairs. Love that chair, saw it in Milan. Uh, and I said, normally I don't do that, but at that time, you know what? I have to, I have to build a Ponty chair. So um, it's not a copy; it just uses a principle. Uh, it has a plywood seat, very similar than on the Framus um, table. Uh, therefore, you get much, uh, the original was, had a woven seat, so you get much more stiffness, so you can actually take the third rail on the side out. And the, the, the shaping is very different. Um, all the joints are, are parallel, which is not an original chair. And I, I mean, this is more, it's more of what you, I think it's, it's a call to study because I think I have a deeper understanding um, 
of that chair. It's it's not it's not meant for production. And then the final um, chair, I have to um, give credit to my um, my colleague John Dunnigan. We designed that together for a RISD dorm, and I will talk about this later. It's basically it's a we want to make it school chair. It's all solid wood, like a traditional uh, school chairs um, are made. Um, and it's very archetypical. You tip it 3% th uh, back for having a slope in the seat for more comfort. Um, and then you have an H stretcher on the back, and that's pretty much it. Um, and then the final one, uh, the, the table, the, the name of the table, farm table, or it, um, alludes to that, really looks at um, farm tables with very basic geometry, basic joints. Uh, the only thing that might be a little bit different is the, the Y stretcher or X, yeah, it's a Y stretcher to give more um, room for the, um, for the sitter uh, to comfortably stretch out their legs. Um, third section, um, so the, um, the thing about sitting is, um, it's not very good for you to sit, period. And if you, if you sit, you want to be active, you want to move around. So, and, um, for, for, especially for office chairs, that's very important. So the first um, chair that dealt with that was a levered chair, where you have a very simple structure. You have plastic shell, and um, you have two pivot points. The minute you sit on that chair, the, the front, um, um, the weight of the chair brings the backrest forward and spring loads the backrest. So therefore, that backrest is following your back when you're moving around. So it has an ergonomic advantage. Um, the, the chair that, the elastic chair um, was basically dealing with the same principle, two pivot points, sitter puts weight on, uh, the back comes forward and spring loads it. Um, you can see here as a frame, you can see the two pivot points and how when you put uh, weight on it, you automatically bring the, the backrest forward. Um, and I, I do think, uh, um, well, let me, s the, the last project in that category is a forward chair. Um, that deals with the fact that um, we all working on computers and our chairs are actually not very well designed for working on computers because we move, we are constantly moving, uh, leaning over a keyboard without having any lumbar support. So um, this was um, really the attempt to change that. Um, you, you separate out the lumber and the backrest, the higher backrest. They both have their own pivot points. So um, that enables you to bring the lumber much more forward. If you would have a regular backrest and you bring it forward, you're actually trapping the, sit, the sitter. Uh, when you bring the lumber, uh, only the lumber forward, um, that is not the case any longer. So it, it really works. Um, so um, first, um, when you lean back, you activate the pivot point of the lumbar. Uh, and then when you lean back more, the lumbar actually goes into the netting and then you activating the backrest. Um, and that's a full chair. Um, I have to disclose this is a prototype and this is a chair that I didn't, I hacked an Okamura chair, so I, I didn't, fully, I mean, I made components of this chair, but I didn't make the whole chair. Um, last but not least, and I mean, this is in a way my, my favorite part of the lecture. Um, it's designed for community. In 2018, my dear colleague, John Donegan, and I had the opportunity to design dorm furniture for a new edition of a dorm, which had about um, 
hundred rooms, so the, there were about two hundred units uh, uh, were specified. So two hundred desks, two hundred chairs, two hundred beds, and two hundred dressers, and then um, we, uh, a couple of community tables. Um, very turn uh, turnaround time, very fast from first sketch to delivery of furniture in less than a year, uh, which, which is a tight deadline. Um, and when John and I started the project, uh, we want to achieve two, three things. Um, we want to have a, um, a project that deals with sustainability. Um, uh, we want to uh, make something that's really um, has longevity, which is actually linked to sustainability. And we want to um, we want to provide um, comfort and just a good user experience. And I, I will break that down a little bit. So, so in terms of sustainability, um, all this is all hard, European beach hardwood, and it's uh, PEFC certified. So that means it comes out of forests which uh, which are tightly monitored um, uh, for regrowth. So every tree that's cut down is um, growing back, or even multiple trees uh, growing back. So it's a cycle. Um, then we used um, bamboo ply. Bamboo is a is a grass basically that grows very fast and captures a lot of carbon. And um, the 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 lacquer on this use is water based. Um, so this was all the ingredients. Then longevity. John and I. I mean, you can see it on the chair structurally. Um, that's a very strong structure. Um, we really push the manufacturer hard to use the proper joints, um, and so far so good. We didn't have any uh, broken pieces yet, and the stuff is definitely abused. So we are pretty happy about that. While we're designing that, so we also talked to students um, about experiences, and I mean, obviously. A chair has certain curves and that makes it more comfortable. But also, I mean, um, we talked to the students about the cubby that you see, the cubby or the drawer, and then we, uh, it came out that they want a small uh, drawer, which makes sense. And then we have a cubby that um, fits every block that the RISD store sells pretty much. Um, and also, you don't see this on the picture right now. Um, there's also a latch for a pencil on the top shelf. So a, a good user experience was definitely um, something that we concern ourselves quite a bit. So, um, and you have the, here you have the drawer, bamboo drawer, uh, dresser and the bed. The bed is actually, we use the standard components uh, for height adjustability of that manufacturer and that uh, that worked out pretty uh, well it's it's very um i mean that would be one of the it 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 made so much more sense to use that existing part than trying to reinvent that um so and and then the last thing is so this is a uh, this is one of the tables for the common areas and the chairs. And I think this project um, has for me such a significant because I think um, to have young designers or uh, design students, um, I call them young designers because they're designers or artists, um, sitting on something that's um, that is made with um, with um, uh, environmental concerns in mind, uh, with longevity and with solid materials that that are uh, well put together. Hopefully, subconsciously, will affect 
the way they're thinking about this world. And with that, I'm ending my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>